Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, Sanjeev Agarwal. Hi, Mr. Agarwal. Welcome to the session. I'm Nidhi from Fiki. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. So without further ado, I, I welcome you all to the fourth Climate Startup Showcase being organized under the aegis of the Fiki Center for Sustainability Leadership. The center, as you all may be aware, has been set up uh, for advancing the sustainability journey of Indian industry with special focus on SMEs. Hindustan Unilever is the founding member of the center. Uh, today's session, uh, as we are aware, focuses on the theme of clean energy and low carbon technologies and has been specially curated by the center's knowledge partner, EQ Investment Advisors. We have amongst us a panel of experts who would share their insights and feedback on the presentations by the startups. Uh, we are delighted to welcome Mr. Bobby Polly, Managing Partner at the One Planet Partners Fund, EQ. Uh, Mr. Polly is a seasoned investment professional with over 23 years of experience and specializes in private equity and strategy consulting. He has played an important role in founding the private equity business at Tata Group and managing the $600 million Tata Opportunities Fund. With a track record of successful exits and championing new investments, Mr. Polly brings extensive expertise in value creation across portfolio assets. Um, Mr. Sanjeev Agarwal is our next expert. He's the founder and chairman of Hexa Climate. Welcome to the session, sir. Uh, Mr. Sanjeev Agarwal joined Hexa as executive chairman in August 2023. Prior to joining Hexa Climate, he was founder, MD and CEO of Amplis Solar. It's now acquired by Petronas. Uh, he received, uh, uh, I'm very glad to actually announce this, that he received the Fiki Young Leaders Award in 2013 and was featured in Finance Monthly Global CEO Awards in 2016. Uh, apart from the uh, many other accolades, he has been chosen as one of the 100 most powerful solar business leaders in the Indian PV market and many more accolades, as I said. Uh, we are grateful for all of you to join us today along with our participants who come from various industry across cutting industry sectors, uh, banks, funding agencies, and many startups who are finding their feet in the climate uh, and sustainability uh, practice arena. Uh, some housekeeping rules for uh, for the session today. Uh, we have allocated uh, 10 minutes to uh, for the innovative solutions for each of the startups. And following each presentation, our expert panelists will provide their valuable feedback. Uh, we have kind of allocated 10 minutes for the observations as well. So total being 20 minutes allocated to a particular startup. Uh, time permitting, we will also request the participants to, you know, uh, put in their questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, they can also raise uh, their hands and, you know, we can uh, unmute them and uh, they can ask the question live during the session. Uh, should I, uh, I, I'll call the first startup of the day, um, Mr. Manohar Betabudi from Universe. Uh, I welcome you to the fourth startup showcase. And over to you for your presentation. Just take a minute to present something. Is my screen visible? Yes, uh the this has uh, the presentation has come up. Yeah. It's, it's full screen. Okay, and, uh, I hope I'm audible uh, everything. Oh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, quite excited to be here. And I thank uh, Fiki and UK for giving this opportunity. So, why do we exist? You know, I mean, uh, so working for almost seven, eight years in the battery materials and e mobility space and looking at the uh, clean tech uh, goals for India. We are talking about having an EV penetration of more than 30% and clean energy goals of more than uh, 200 gigawatts. Uh, Mr. Manohar, okay. can I can I just come in? I uh, uh, for me, your voice is a little unclear. Uh, probably uh, there's some kind of sound at the background, very feeble, but uh, I think it could be better. Is it better now? Yes, I I as for me, yeah, it's it's more audible right now. Okay, okay. So India has you know massive clean energy goals. I think. Uh, 
and also you need penetration so looking at both of them and the battery demand is going to rise significantly however you know if you look at the current uh, scenario almost 100% of the battery cells are being imported from the usual suspects and if you look at any of the projects you know 30 to 40% of the entire project uh, is based upon battery so we believe battery is a critical technology where india needs to have i would say some amount of control both on the technology as well as on the supply chain and that's why we decided to focus on indigenous uh, sodium ion uh, cell technology uh, developed originally at iit kgp so we are leveraging the patent which has been filed by them so the idea is that we industrialize this technology we already seen that the based on the life cycle assessment the is much more i would say lower the footprints of the sodium ion cell technology is much more lower than compared with traditional lithium technology uh, i'm sorry but i'll have to request you mr manohar to come a little closer to the mic uh, is it audible to the other to the experts uh, mr polly would you be able to are you able to hear uh... yes but intermittently it is a little soft okay uh, one has to strain a bit i don't know maybe uh, if it's not improving maybe we'll just plug it through but uh, if it can be improved may be useful yeah okay okay so this is the team uh, i come with almost 16 years of experience uh, last 7 years in both clean mobility and battery materials uh, and uh, my i have a btech mechanical engineering from jain to hyderabad and an mba from iim cal my role would be fundamentally to get involved in market seeding industrialization and of course the critical uh, i would say fundraising and dr amrish joins from uh, iit kgp has got more than 20 years of uh, experience uh, different kind of battery materials he is also a big believer in having indigenous uh, sodium ion uh, battery materials then i have pamalika uh, she comes with more than 15 years of experience in both brand building and uh, gtm both i and pamalika were colleagues at monovol she will also be playing a key role of brand building and gt market gtm and then we have dr arjuna he holds a phd in sodium ion cell technology comes with uh, deep expertise both in uh, cathode materials as well as separators i think he will is going to play a key role in actually uh, doing the entire industrialization so we have developed the chemistry using three most common elements uh, sodium iron and carbon to the right you can see our unique hollow structure of sodium ion phosphate the advantage is that it is inherently be non flammable there is no mineral constraint and no hazard for uh, i would say end of life disposable and uh, the key advantage of this chemistry is that it can use existing lithium ion cell manufacturing technologies so we don't need to create any separate infrastructure just to just drop into existing infrastructures This is the comparison of sodium ion vis-a-vis other uh, chemistries and technologies which are available. So we can see sodium wins on two parameters very clearly: cost and safety. I think both of which are very important for a market like India. This is the market size globally. It is going to be close to half a trillion dollar market by 2030, and uh, four terawatt of battery demand is required by 2030. However, the entire supply, more than 70 percent of the supply, is currently located in China. and in india also we are going to see a four fold rise in the demand driven by both energy storage and uh, e mobility so we anticipate over the next period of 5 to 6 years the total demand for battery will be close to 600 gigawatt hour and we are focused on light electric mobility and uh, short duration energy storage these are some of the advantages cost today we have an advantage of around 30% compared to already reduced prices of uh, i would say lithium and performance this chemistry can withstand more than 60 degrees on the higher side and on the lower side around minus 10 to minus 50 degrees carbon footprint much lower based on a life cycle assessment largely because there is no lithium cobalt nickel or any other rare earth material and critically i think we are going to provide our country with strategic autonomy in terms of both raw materials and technology we have seen how a uh, event in the past actually disrupted the supply chains and the critical technology which is going to drive the entire clean energy i would say transition uh, should be actually uh, available both in india both from a technology and a material perspective 
Now, if you look at the entire factory ecosystem, you know, there are, there are four building blocks. First is the material, second is the cell, third is the system, and the supporting block is the machinery. Now, India has done very well in the system building block. There are more than 500 companies which are participating in this space. And that includes all the pack manufacturers, electric two-wheelers, three-wheelers, four-wheelers, and energy storage companies. But if you look at the materials and the cell space, we have done have not done a great job there. And that's where uh, the focus of universe is, both on materials and on the uh, cells. Especially on the materials, uh, our chemistry is such that we don't need to do any mining and refining, which is important in the case of lithium. So we process and synthesize our own electron materials using industrial precursors readily available in India. Likewise, we would like to develop our own cells. We actually develop cells in our existing lab. The future, the the outlook is that we focus both on the materials as well as on the cells. This is the global landscape. As you can see, it is a healthy participation from both, I would say, Chinese and non-Chinese companies. Globally, about 10 odd players are competing and uh, three players are almost closer to the verge of industrialization and probably in an eight to 10 months of time frame, you will have commercial cells being made available. This is the performance of our chemistry vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what is available in the market. As you can see, our performance is comparable to what's probably the best in the market in terms of both energy density and cycle life. However, our advantage is that we don't use any nickel, titanium, vanadium, cobalt. We use organic waste to actually make synthesize our anode completely indigenous. And this chemistry is suited for fast charging. And today itself, you know, the day zero cost is competitive when you compare with LFP. So our business model is initially focused on uh, cells and uh, raw materials. As we evolve, we would like to have more, I would say, uh, licensing and contract manufacturing tie-ups. This is our value, entire value chain, uh, right from electro raw material to electro preparation to cell fabrication, entire characterization. As you can see, we are working both with domestic industrial uh, chemical manufacturers as well as uh, organic waste to make our electro materials. And these are some of the uh, challenges or risks which we anticipate in terms of uh, supply chain. I think uh, that's the reason we are working with multiple suppliers to kind of de-risk the entire situation. And in terms of technology, I think we are uh, working with one of the best institute uh, in the country to handhold us. And uh, definitely we will have also having additional people to take care of both uh, operations and quality control. Yeah, and uh, in terms of market acceptance, we will see that we have already received a lot of uh, RFIs and RFPs from the market, uh, which shows that there is good interest from the market. And uh, once we are able to execute these pilots, I think that will give us a lot of foothold in the market. Uh, yes, competition definitely exists, but I think uh, with our unique chemistry and cost advantage, uh, we believe we will be able to uh, sustain in the market. And, uh, and the last not the least, I think uh, one of the key uh, resources required to scale this kind of business is capital and uh, we are currently actively in the midst of a fundraising process i think which will help us uh, take this technology to the i would say next logical level of putting up a megawatt scale uh, customer qualification plan which will help us to do a lot of a lot of the many pilots uh, that's it i think uh, that's what i had to share today so i am happy to uh, take any questions which you may have Manohar, let me ask you. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good technology. Uh, one of the questions that probably, I just wanted to understand, where do you stand today in terms of the POC and the some of the early stage products, or is it more in the research phase? We have actually completed the research. We have made uh, prototypes at our end. Uh, we have received the RFPs from an energy storage company and also RFPs from both e-mobility and uh, electric uh, two-wheeler companies and three-wheeler companies. However, uh, however, we do not have enough capacity to supply those large packs. So that's why we are actually investing uh, in a customer qualification plan where we will be scaling up our both electrode material as well as uh, out cell, I would say, fabrication facility. Today, we can make very small quantities, which is okay as a proof of demonstration, but beyond that, we need a larger facility. However, India does not have those facilities, so we will have we are having to create, I would say, at our end. That's where we are. Okay. 
and how do you want to really manufacture it do you want to manufacture in india or outside somewhere no i think as of now we would like to manufacture in india but beyond india we can look at the route of having uh, technology licensing or contract manufacturing and that's the route we want to take and who else is manufacturing this across the world this particular technology as i mentioned there are globally 10 people who are operating uh, this particular operating. technology yes. because all of those are in the lithium ion space also fairly some long. of them some of them are in lithium but sodium ion you are having only 10 to 11 players who are operating in this space okay any any reason that uh, you think that the people are so positive on the lithium ion as compared to this one because this seems to be much simpler and from the raw material perspective this is much yeah, yeah. very pertinent question and i am uh, often asked this question in fact uh, sodium ion chemistry actually started in way back in uh, 1960 okay much earlier than lithium but at that point in time the anode i would say chemistry was not well involved so nanotechnology was not mature yet and that's why this technology could not really catch up and after that uh, everyone knows the story of how china actually jumped in and kind of i would say developed a monopoly on market and now over the last 10 years people have recognized that uh, they people need to work on an alternate uh, chemistry and definitely china plus one strategy is driving this whole development so i think a mix of technical business and uh, political reasons which have now uh, provided that extra attention to this chemistry okay okay All right, so I leave it to Bobby. I think he has some questions. Please go. Yeah, so uh, I think some of my questions were similar to Sanjeev, but uh, Manohar, I mean, given that this is something which requires a fair degree of acceptance from the end users before you are able to, you know, it's not just the development of the technology, the stability, the utilization. Which are the agencies which can actually certify? Uh, I don't know globally. Uh, the 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 legitimacy and the uh, you know and the uh, uh, performance of such uh, battery packs and uh, you know how would you think about yeah so testing the over cycles in... and things like that because it's something which has to be proven over time and unless the customers use it you're going to have a problem uh, you know while yeah. the technology might exist in isolation utilization yeah. might suffer i think that that's where i think we we leverage uh, we benefit from the mature uh, lithium industry so lot of i would say these standards are readily available uh, both on the cell level and on the pack level where the cell needs to certain meet certain uh, qualifying criteria both in terms of uh, performance and safety likewise at pack level uh, in india we have uh, bis standards as well as uh, ari standards for the pack so globally i think these are all uh, similar standards i think uh, once we are able to prove our chemistry out in india i think we'll be able to probably also achieve the similar certifications elsewhere so there are well defined standards which are available i think it's a matter of time probably we are slightly early for doing that once we have that customer qualification plan we can actually produce these cells and uh, send them for qualification both on the materials as well as on the cell and pack and are you able to patent what you are doing given that you you leveraging what iit karakpur has done would you be able to own the patent of whatever you are developing or is that something that you will probably have uh, uh, you know an agreement with iit kgp or wherever so the current uh, patent is held by iit kgp which has been filed so we hold exclusive rights over it and uh, whatever ip is going to be generated so there will be dual rights so so we will be for how long which one duration of the patents you said na duration that you have the right exclusive right yeah so the the current right is for 5 years can be extended at least by another 5 years so 10 years i think in 10 years you will definitely achieve a scale uh, by which i think uh, it doesn't really matter beyond that but even after that we would like to continue the relationship with iit uh, so and of course we are working on our own internal roadmap technology roadmap So from that point of view, I think we have uh, definitely thought through and uh, covered our analysis. How does it compare on various parameters like the depth of discharge, the weight, the temperature degradation, uh, and some other factors as compared to lithium ion? Is it more suitable for, say, mobile usage or more for stationary type of the usage? See, if you look at the current, I would say. Uh, standard i would say where we have reached we have an energy density of 125 and a visibility of 
So that is, uh, I would say, LFP is around 180, 190. So I think a delta of uh, 10 to 15 percent exists in terms of energy density. Uh, but the advantage, as you said, you know, it lies in the performance. Uh, lithium at higher temperatures, you know, degrades very faster, quite faster. Whereas, whereas our technology, even if you use at 60 degrees, when we are claiming 3,000 cycles, we will still be able to give you 3,000 cycles. But the same is not true for lithium. The moment you elevate the temperature, you will see a rapid degradation in the cycle life. Right? Mm -hmm. That is, I would, I would, I would say one. Second, you mentioned about depth of discharge. This chemistry allows you to do a 100% depth of discharge without having any impact on the, I would say, cycle life. And that, that is also an advantage by which you can actually store these batteries for long duration and also transport at zero volts. Right? So that also kind of helps in actually adoption of this whole chemistry. Lithium, if you do a deep discharge, you know, reviving that battery is a challenge. Whereas in our chemistry, you can actually be slightly be more, I would say, abusive with the chemistry in terms of the way you use. So I would say a lot of uh, independence comes to the user where people forget to charge or probably they are slightly more aggressive on the use, right? So I would say this chemistry is more abuse tolerant when compared to uh, lithium technology. And what about the round trip efficiency of this one? Round trip efficiency would be close to 90%. Which is similar to the lithium. Yeah, model. lithium. Yeah. They're comparable. And all, what is your expectation of overall uh, funding that you'll require? One, to establish and prove the technology. And second, uh, for setting up, you know, what could be a potential manufacturing unit? And what do you think will be your path? Do you want to tie up with some existing battery players to potentially give you that uh, uh, you know, speed and efficiency. What is your thought process on so, so the initial, commercialization uh, and scaling up? Yeah, so the so the initial investment which we are currently seeking, which will help us to get to that megawatt scale, you know, and that means we'll be able to supply to about 500 electric scooters or maybe 300 uh, electric e rickshaws. So we will need close to six stores to get that done, and that will give us a runway of about 18 odd months. And uh, beyond that, and we would definitely like to explore the route of adding our own capacity as well as working with the existing lithium and cell manufacturers so we can actually uh, supply them the electrode materials and we can start uh, leveraging their existing facilities in fact we have already identified a couple of companies in india so we have a lot of i would say capacity available for manufacturing but as i said i think the first logical step is to achieve this next step i think megawatt scale once we are able to do it's a matter of actually replicating and scaling it right? and, and how much about, time do you think you yeah i think we would need about uh, 10 months to get there i think from setting up to the plant and doing the first pilots getting the feedback getting the certification so 10 to 12 months i think is a i would say uh, we, have to, we have been conservative but I think that's what i think will require so one year from now i think we'll be we should be in a very good state and what will be like your main uh competitive strength, say one year or two years on down the line, whether it's the technology, the scale of manufacturing, the marketing, what will it be? In your I think there will be two critical advantages. Uh, one is the technology. I think we offer the completely indigenous material supply chain, which is devoid of any rare earth. That chemistry will be very unique to us, uh, very safe and at the same time cost efficient. And the other advantage which I think will accrue to us is in terms of uh, our getting first to the market. I think the biggest mode will be how quickly we can actually place ourselves in the market. We are very close to getting to the market. I think if we are able to build on both of this, I think the rest of other I think advantages can accrue over a period of time. And definitely brand, once we are working with the customers, I think definitely we can build a market. And the other area which I think you not mentioned is uh, substitution of lead acid market. I think our technology, both because of the nature of performance as well as on the cost curve, we have an op opportunity to, I would say, disrupt a significant portion of the lead acid market. So that, again, I think will help us in scaling this whole overall technology. Hmm. See, my uh, I, I don't know how much time we have, but my only a view on these things is about this that you know if there is a, some technology which actually works then the manufacturing scale what happens in particularly china 
is something where we lose game most of the time and we have seen it in in almost like in every manufacturing sector unless there is a significant domestic protection so if there is significant domestic protection things can work for some time yeah, yeah. but from so actually there perspective... is a there is a protection by the government so there is already a 5% import duty on cells which is going to go up to 10 to 15% in the next coming years so that will actually protect i would say companies like us uh, but again i think uh, for them to really come and disrupt in sodium, I think uh, it will be challenging because they will not enjoy any special, I would say, benefits. Unlike lithium, where they have control on all the supply chain, sodium, they also have to start from probably build their own capacities. Of course, they have expertise in industrialization of lithium. That will come handy. Uh, but we believe it will not be a cakewalk for them and definitely in sodium. I think if, as an ecosystem, we are all coming together and scaling this technology to few gigawatt hours in the next three to four years, I think definitely we can actually defend ourselves. What do you think will be the cost per kilowatt hour? Like there is certain cost in lithium. I yes, yes. Today, today we have visibility of around uh, 50, 50 ish. 50 dollars per kWh. Yeah, yeah. That can be very competitive yeah. if it actually translates into large volumes. And are people globally manufacturing at this price or nobody is manufacturing? Uh, not at this price sodium the re reason is uh, most of them are working with uh, layered cathode which use uh, the nickel cobalt manganese so there they have a disadvantage in terms of the cathode chemistry but in our in our case you know we have an advantage in terms of the cathode side uh, likewise today on the anode side most are working with hard carbon now hard carbon supply is quite less and localized in few regions so that's why the chemistry of the bomb cost of sodium today is higher than when compared to lithium uh, but i think it will correct itself in the next two to three years that is what we anticipate but nevertheless i think uh, uh, our chemistry is very similar to lfp which is actually kind of dominating the entire lithium industry so i think the next uh, two to three years once we are able to scale we will also have a very disproportionate advantage in our cost i think the cost is i think will be a major, I think, ad advantage and also will drive people to adopt actually this whole technology. Because performance, I think, at the end of the day, every chemistry will actually be able to meet. Uh, it's a function of adding few materials here and there. You can always achieve the performance. But are you able to meet the cost? I think that is, I think that is where will drive this entire uh, market. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, so, with your permission, uh, experts, I'll invite the next uh, starter. I think we've, uh, if if the questions are over, yeah, yeah, the questions are never over. Yeah, but, true, but, true. So, uh, with the time, uh, I thought we yeah, should yeah, be. Said here, true. Yeah. So, I'll invite yeah. our next uh, starter, uh, Martin Abdul from Grassroots, to join us for the presentation. Usually the first one ends up getting the most of the time. So yeah. Need to be. Yeah. Uh hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh yeah. so <clears throat> yeah, may I request Shika to yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, I'm Matin, uh, CEO and co-founder at Grassroots Energy. Uh, we are uh, basically into clean fuels. Uh, we produce carbon negative clean fuels. Uh, next. Uh, the reason why we uh, exist is we are helping companies to um, address some of the challenges on ESG. Um, and there is a need uh, to address the problem of uh, sc reducing the scope one emissions by some of the companies have uh, has announced uh, carbon neutral goals. Uh, there is a need for uh, drop in fuel uh, with a minimal uh, change in infrastructure. Uh, maybe the right word is drop in fuels because uh, with the minimal changes, people want to companies want to move to a cleaner fuels with uh, a pathway to hydrogen and there are larger challenges of a lack of gas grids everywhere and and there are uh, th while there is a significant amount of agricultural waste it is not being put to good use next uh, can you put this slide uh, in a full screen mode if it's okay Uh, what we offer is um, a, a bio CNG and also a solution on biohydrogen. We'll talk about the hydrogen in a bit. 
Uh, the bio CNG is a uh, is a versatile fuel. Uh, we can help uh, companies to produce it on the uh, site, uh, store it in different places, and uh, transport it and feed into the gas grids. Uh, thereby providing the uh, fuels. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, providing the fuels with a replacement for diesel, LPG, uh, and uh, even furnace oil, etc. So this helps to reduce the scope one and scope three emissions um, uh, in a with the minimal infrastructural changes. The next slide, please. Uh, so it's a way, it's a fairly large uh, market uh, with a significant opportunity, and we're trying to get a, a share of that. Next. So uh, about uh, our uh, credibility, we have been uh, accelerated and invested by Shell, and we uh, have been um, um, and different other ecosystems as well, including uh, Zintio, uh, Harvard Innovation Labs. Uh, we have uh, uh, IP across both BioCNG and hydrogen. Uh, we also have received a third-party uh, uh, validation from um, from consenting from the KPMG and also received government grants from uh, in Indian government, UK and US government. On the hydrogen, we have been working uh, with the academic institutions both in India and in UK. Next. So the way, uh, these, are, these are the various IPs which we have built, which helps us to offer the clean fuels in a cost-effective and most importantly, energy-efficient uh, manner. Next. So this is the process. Um, there are, there are di we can work with 30 plus different feedstocks, uh, which could be in the com which could be an agricultural or any kind of which is organic residues. Uh, the one with the green patches is where we bring in the uh, value addition across the value chain. We process that into biogas and then uh, purify the gas into natural gas grade fuel, and then we can um, uh, 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 provide the gas to the point of consumption. Could be in a uh, processed manner, or it could be feeding into the uh, grid. And the residue from the operations, we process that into a uh, biochar, which is a, a carbon, um, permanent carbon sequestration solution. Next. So uh, just to give a little context, different feedstocks have different uh, yields. Uh, we can always mix and match in terms of what is available in the local area. Uh, and then uh, we are interested in producing the uh, quality and quantity uh, based on what what the end user requirements are. So we can work backwards in term to understand what is available and then uh, plan it accordingly. Next. We, uh, a typical uh, bio CNG process is a carbon neutral uh, process. Why, if you can capture the CO2, which is close to about 40% in the process, then the entire process becomes a carbon negative clean fuel, which is also called as BEX, uh, which basically means the, uh, the, 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 the carbon credits which is available will be significantly higher, which becomes the incentive uh, which specific to this kind of fuel compared to other options. Next. I'm taking help. So these are the three broad sizes, if I can put it, and then we'll have examples in terms of what we are doing with various corporates. Uh, we can work on the small scale, which is uh, uh, typically un uh, producing close to about 600 kgs or so under two uh, megawatt. Uh, and, the, and another mid category would be about say 6,000 kgs and the larger category would be uh, 12,000 kgs and beyond. Uh, uh, and for each of these categories, we're working in those uh, segments. Um, the next slide, please. This is an example which we're working with Tata Power. Uh, we uh, they, they have a division called Mini Grids, uh, which currently uses uh, a diesel as a part of the energy mix. Solar, uh, diesel, and the battery bank is the is the current uh, energy mix. We're trying to replace uh, the diesel with a uh, closer to the point of consumption on um, uh, uh, close, closer to the point of consumption, the bio CNG gets produced. As we speak, we're commercializing a installation. Uh, this will be operational by uh, September. And they uh, they have a significant mandate to scale this up. Uh, and we're also getting a support from uh, GAP, which is a part of the Rockefeller entity. Uh, this will be a showcase uh, demonstration project with a significant upside uh, with this uh, entity and also uh, other, other players in the segment. So this is an example where in the middle of the picture, you see a diesel generator which got replaced with the bio CNG, which is, which is a gas generator where the fuel was produced um, near the point of consumption. At this point of time, we're replacing um, the fossil fuel in about 10 locations uh, with a, uh, with a um, scalable scalability and visibility. Next slide, please. So this is, next slide, please. Uh, 
ভালো Hi, is the screen visible? I'm sorry, the screen has just frozen at my end, so I'm not sure. Is it okay now? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so so yeah. This is an example which we are working with one of the leading FMCG companies. So this is an example on thermal. Uh, so we uh, have done a techno commercial uh, feasibility and uh, we are now in a stage of signing commercial contracts. Um, so the example here is we are uh, producing the clean fuel, taking it to the factory location. You reduce the fuel from about a high pressure of 200 bar all the way up to a consumption point of two bar. And it is fed into the uh, boilers in this case. And um, the, the, the methane on the top, you can see, uh, which is 90, 92%. Uh, to give an understanding, 90% and above is considered as natural fuel, natural gas fuel, and uh, the the efficiencies uh, are derived if the fuel is beyond 90%. Uh, so this ensures that uh, the fuel is, since it's a food a food item in in this case, which we are, uh, which we have showcased, the quality and the multiple teams have validated the solution, and we are now, as we speak, rolling out a commercial solution uh, for this entity. Next slide, please. So this is another example where uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, revamping one of the existing uh, facilities in Gujarat where uh, the the gas will be fed into the gas grids, uh, which uh, it's, it's an industrial, industrial area and some of the customers uh, will be, uh, we, are, we are working with one of the city gas companies if how, how can we distribute uh, to the last mile um, uh, in terms of users. So this becomes a, one of the interesting use cases where the gas is fed, uh, fed into the gas grids directly. Next slide, please. So these are some of the um, uh, partners with whom we are taking the solution to the market. Uh, and the residue, uh, which is the biochar um, and the fertilizers, we have tested with some of the agricultural in, uh, universities. Uh, and uh, we, this solution will be used to replace the uh, chemical fertilizers in this case. The next slide, please. So this is the attraction we have built so far in both these categories. Uh, we uh, have a mandate to set up uh, some of these some of these installations. The model which we are looking at is uh, to build, own, and operate. I'll talk about the uh, funding and the mechanisms in a bit. Uh, the idea is to uh, have a long-term offtake commitment from some of these companies, which be becomes a uh, opportunity for us to engage uh, on a multi-project basis. The next slide, please. So uh, this is the, uh, we are, uh, we have a robust uh, scale-up mechanism where some of these projects, we have a multi-year visibility uh, and we are interested in um, deep diving in some, of these in some of these companies with multiple locations. And of course, we are um, willing to talk to other companies in the similar adjoining spaces. Yeah, next slide, please. So what is interesting, and this could be um, of interest, is we're using our know-how on the fermentation to produce the hydrogen. So what it means is we're using the same asset, uh, which can produce biocng at this point of time, we can produce hydrogen. Uh, and uh, there is a know-how both on the microbial and also on the reactor design, uh, which basically means whenever the ecosystem is ready in terms of the offtake, equipment readiness, safety guidelines, et cetera, we can flip the switch and produce hydrogen. Uh, thereby offering a pathway to uh, hydrogen uh, in the in the in the near in the near future in addition we can produce further quantities of hydrogen uh, with the additional um, uh, equipment which we can add which is a stage 2 uh, which can produce incremental quantities of hydrogen if required next slide please so these are the different applications as far as the hydrogen is concerned uh, which uh, we believe could be a um, and uh, short-term addressable uh, market segments, uh, which could be across uh, the thermal and mobility applications and gas grids being one of the uh, larger segments. The next slide, please. So we have, I mean, bio-based hydrogen uh, is one of the cost-effective alternatives compared to the electrolysis. Uh, we uh, even status quo from any forms of biohydrogen is a uh, is a uh, is a significantly lower in terms of cost. Our uh, specific approach, uh, we believe uh, we can um, uh, hit a commercial readiness uh, with a kind of uh, a price point which is expected as early as in the next uh, say twenty four to thirty six months. The next slide, please. So the biochar, which is a output, uh, we um, uh, believe could be a significant um, um, value in terms of the carbon credits, uh, which can also make some of the projects um, 
you know, in terms of uh, more bankable. Uh, there is an interest on um, the biochar-based credit. This is something which we are testing out in a couple of locations. Um, this, we believe, could be an interesting uh, alternative uh, to produce uh, large quantities of carbon credits from the same infrastructure which we have. Next slide, please. So some of our uh, solutions have been uh, vetted by third-party assessments. Uh, for example, our um, the entire lifecycle analysis was vetted by uh, Mission Innovation. Uh, some of our technologies like the enrichment solutions have been uh, assessed by Solar Impulse uh, as one of the most energy efficient uh, in its category globally. And the carbon credit mechanisms for different capacities has been um, assessed by uh, South Pole. The next slide, please. So this is the uh, operating uh, model uh, wherein we, based on the signed agreements from some of these corporates, we attract uh, project financing uh, wherein we bring in the technical know-how and the uh, investor brings in the uh, capital, uh, which brings us a incentive for, set, for us to set up the SPV, uh, which uh, can have multiple of these revenue streams and each of the SPV can have uh, can house similar assets uh, under each of the uh, under each of these corporates. So that becomes an operating model. That way we can be capital light as we um, scale up. The next slide, please. So this is the team. Uh, we uh, have, uh, the team has significant amount of experience uh, in different markets. Uh, and, um, uh, and we also have a strong uh, advisory board uh, who have been in the industry, uh, build business, different businesses. The next slide, please. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, briefly about us and happy to uh, take any questions. Yeah, can I, I can go first. So one, I think it's a very interesting thing that you're doing and I'd be very keen to have a follow-up discussion with you separately. But having said that, two important points I just want to understand just now. How is your pricing arrangement with your customers, uh, you know, relative to, uh, the cost and the alternative that they currently have? You know, for what duration are you uh, having those arrangements and how are you arriving at what would be a price? Uh, having arrived at a price, what would you think that the ROI on such a project might be with the carbon credits that you can or without? Uh, you know, and how does that vary? And uh, given that you are actually starting with a 3070 uh, debt equity mix. Do you think that over a period of time you might be able to juice it up further because once the development risk goes away, are you able to improve the mix? So for what is the kind of ROI uplift that you think you can get from an equity perspective uh, uh, on a project of the nature that you're talking about? And last but not the least, I'm conscious that people like Thermax is working with Ever Enviro, GPS. These are all firms which are already doing some commercial arrangements around compressed biogas. Uh, how would you compare against uh, some of them in the market? Uh, but I must say what you're doing is an interesting space with a lot of potential. Yeah, so uh, multiple questions. So let me uh, answer all of them. So first one, uh, in terms of the pricing, uh, we have broadly, um, I would say, um, categorized into three uh, buckets. The first one is uh, where some of the pricing where we have uh, or are contracts where the pricing is against the LPG. The question always is, what are we replacing? So in case if you're replacing LPG, uh, there are two kinds of scenarios. One, we're able to match the existing commercial contracts that becomes incentive for some of the companies to uh, go ahead and sign. And there are also discussions where uh, we are offering anywhere between five to 10% discount compared to the existing commercial contracts that becomes, that, that excites the finance departments to say yes to in many of these cases. Second category is primarily when we are comparing, when we are replacing the pipe natural gas, uh, uh, there we are trying to match those prices, which basically means whatever the moving prices of those PNG are, uh, we will be able to match those prices on an ongoing basis. And third category is, this is a niche category, but nevertheless it's there, where there are certain companies who are willing to pay a premium of five to 10% uh, because there is an element of sustain, uh, 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 sustainability, green fuel, et cetera. Uh, those are also uh, also happening. So these are the three broad categories. In many of these cases, the corporate is never worse off. The second, in terms of the carbon credits, uh, as, a part, as a part of a business modeling, we don't include the carbon credits that's on top of it. Um, so uh, we need to have a pool of assets before we can realize the carbon credits and uh, make um, a larger case. Um, so, but the business model does not include that. 
And in terms of uh, the last case, there are, yes, there are a lot of corporates, but I would say we were one of the few companies who have been making a uh, working uh, with uh, some of the corporates. And thanks to the ecosystems we have been and backed by some of the um, uh, names or ecosystems we are part of it, I think we made a headroom. Uh, I think even though we are a small company, we, are, we have some of these active uh, conversations of fairly a large chunk of uh, num uh, companies, but I think we... Uh, have ironed out a lot of these uh, technical issues in terms of how do we deploy the equipment in a corporate setting? What are the kind of safety elements? How do we overcome the uh, compliances? Uh, how do we ensure that the uh, designing is done in different scenarios? I think there, uh, some of these uh, expertise uh, from some of the advisory board, who's also ex Thermax and a few other companies is definitely helping us to accelerate our journey. And on the pricing that you're able to get relative to the investment, I don't know what's the investment you require for uh, a minimum economic size uh, uh, operation. What would be your ROI given that you want to match the yeah. costs of an existing stream? Uh, are you able to make a return? I was thinking, yeah. are you able to juice up the returns over time? Good question. So some of our investors are basically who have built solar companies, solar companies in the past of solar projects. So the reason why they are backing this asset is this is a new asset class with a little bit of IRR returns. So the range, if I can give, could be anywhere between 16% to 23% uh, uh, project IRRs. Uh, and uh, this is excluding the carbon credits. I think uh, it's always a factor of the gas, uh, the multiple revenue streams, which make this business a little more exciting compared to solar. You also got, you got gas and also fertilizers. So any organization which can, which has made significant work on the fertilizers becomes a uh, icing on the uh, top that becomes a uh, better project returns. Uh, in our case, like I've mentioned, we have worked significantly in terms of uh, uh, deriving value out of the residues. Uh, and if you can move into the pathway of biochar, it can only uh, make us case stronger. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So I have a question, uh, Martin. I think it's a, it's a good field and we are also doing some work in this area. Uh, so the biggest challenge to my mind in this industry is about the collection of the biomass. And uh, so, and people have different strategies to deal with that. People say, we'll do our own plantation. We have these cooperatives. We have these farmers, et cetera, et cetera. We know the on-ground situation. But uh, how real is the risk and how do you think that uh, anybody can mitigate it? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So it often gets asked. So we have um, uh, worked quite a bit in terms of de-risking from a from a investors and also from the corporates point of view. If I have to categorize, there are four broad categories in which this biomass problem comes in. The first category is you 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 work with the industrial residues like press mart, which is the sugar factories. Then some of the agri processing uh, where you uh, ha where you can afford to have a long term offtake commitments and that is possible. And second category would be to work with some of the uh, biomass aggregators. In fact, as we speak, we are tying up with two of the large biomass aggregators who are present in fairly uh, large chunks of the country, uh, where we are trying to get into a partnership where they could be the sourcing partner and we will be the technology and a deployment partner that de-risks because they work with diverse range of feed feedstock and they have built the credibility in the last. Uh, a decade or so. So that becomes like a larger uh, catchment area uh, to reach uh, many of these uh, markets. Third category would be to work with some of the larger FPOs who has a fairly large farmer base. We, of course, they have they they don't have some of the skill sets and the know-how. We build the capacity in those companies so that they know what is the standard operating procedure, et cetera. And we are working with some of the missionary uh, companies so that the, the FPOs can eventually own uh, these equipments and the incentives are there as far as the equipments are concerned and some of the working capital can be arranged. And the last category would be like you mentioned, which is the energy plantations. And we have built some capabilities on how do we do these energy uh, plantations and how do we optimize it? I think I think a, I think between these four of these models, you can potentially set up uh, a bioenergy plant in most parts of parts of the country. Yeah, I think theoretically it's all sounds good, but people because the, I remember a lot of people set up the biomass power plants in the two thousands. Uh, between 2000 and 2010. And most of these plants didn't run for more than three, four, five years, simply for the lack of the biomass feedstock. Uh, and the farmers get smarter because you set up your facility there. Uh, they know that you can't go away anywhere now. 
and they start increasing the feedstock for raw material price. So that I think you should be aware of. I'm sure you have studies. So I obviously a lot of companies are now working in this area. So they must be having some plan in mind uh, because uh, we can't assume that people don't know this risk. Obviously. Yeah, that, uh, that's a good question. I'll address this in two ways. Firstly, uh, the, the comparison with um, biomass to electricity uh, might not be relevant because there the headroom and the margins are very minimal. Uh, here we're talking about two different product classes where of the if you can get of the entire designing element and the technology element right, so you will have enough gross margins in this case. Uh, and and secondly, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the and the yields, so since we mentioned there is also a technology play in this case, our ability to derive higher yields uh, is also an advantage which works in our favor. Okay. Uh, there, I can see two questions typed in the Q and A. Would you like to take them? Uh, one, uh, by Mr. D. Uh, one question is uh, from Mr. D. D. Maheshwari. He is asking the logistics of raw material for a five thousand M three plant. And uh, second is also from him. It says that how is this different from oil companies uh, SATAT project? Yeah, so let me answer the second one first. See, Satat is primarily a policy for the oil and gas companies and not for a project developers or for the corporate. So we consciously, I mean, and this in the in the Satat, uh, the, uh, the oil and gas companies off take the gas only if there is in and around demand uh, for the particular small geography, primarily from the point of view on automotive consumption only. In this case, we are addressing the problem of industries, which is a fairly large address segment. Secondly, uh, there is an already an existing working uh, uh, factory or manufacturing unit which can consume the gas right from day one. There is no need for the demand to be uh, scaled up unless otherwise it's a new factory. So to that extent, we're talking about a ready market or rather a ready uh, segment to be adopted. Of course, the signing the B2B contracts and getting the readiness of the company uh, will take time. But once they are on board, uh, then the consumption uh, gets um, started right from day one. So to the extent, the repayment of the interest, the cash cycles can start kicking in. In terms of the logistics, I think I um, quickly answered this four categories. So depending on the location, uh, in fact, before we say yes to your corporate, the first thing we do is something called techno commercial feasibility study, and then a detailed feedstock analysis. In fact, we're using some of the satellite data and some of the technology to make use uh, of the information, whether the particular geography has enough feedstock availability over the last few years so that we have a robust data to support uh, before we can take a, a call, whether to proceed into the conversation or not. Thank you. Uh... By way of introduction, Mr. Maheshwari is an uh, advisor with Alchemy and Ursol. And uh, thanks for taking up his questions. Uh, he also says that existing factories' availability of land at its cost will be a major issue. That's a yeah, so in, the, in this majority of the cases, you may or may not have the, uh, we might not set up the factory on premises. That would be ideal though, uh, but which basically means the gas can be transported uh, from the nearest uh, point of generation. Uh, but the long term would be to uh, feed into the gas grids and then uh, arrive at a mechanism where these companies, if they have a gas connection uh, to offset, I mean, like in the case of solar, uh, RECs are being uh, attracted. But th that is a pathway which we believe the industry will move towards. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Abdul. Uh, so I'll, I'll move to the next uh, presentation. I'll, I'll uh, invite uh, Mr. Ronak Mistry from Greenovate to... Uh, for his presentation, please. Mr. Abdul, welcome to the session. I hope you can share. Hello, hi, good afternoon. Hi. Thanks, thanks for giving me the time and opportunity out here for presenting the about technology. Would you want me to share my screen or would you, you be showing around the presentation for me? Yeah, Hello, am you I can audible? Yeah, you can share. If there's an issue, then we can also share. So. Am, I, am I audible really? I guess, uh, is there a lag or something? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you.
Right. So uh, let's talk about Grinovate out. The Grinovate solutions appeared, and what we are trying to achieve is generally the concept about what I guess uh, the previous the previous fellow participant was mentioning about how carbon capture is one of the key essentials, and they're trying to work from pre-combustion carbon capture points and creating biofuels in order to create materials. But we try to work post-combustion, and post-combustion coming upon for all the processes coming in cement industries, uh, textiles, uh, metals, oil and gas, etc. The idea started with the thought that we wanted actually to create a recycling, re re reutilization of. Uh, pollutants and our pollutants were specifically chosen as air pollutants and the challenge happened around was that we want we figured that as the first table first stage of any recycling is going around to collect the pollutant and we could not figure that how are the challenges in order to collect pollute air pollutants since we went to the source, we went to the uh, culprits where the emission happened and we went to industries and the idea is that we can capture the industrial pollution at the source point itself and then try to convert it, convert those emissions into resources which can be used for various other purposes. That's the philosophy behind the uh, basically that's basically talking about Grinovit solutions how we would like to say is that in industries contribute majorly 30 thus emissions are generally considered upon from the hard to abate and the heavy sector industries are the oil and gas petroleum steel and cements and other areas but what happens is in the industrial norms that 20 percent scale goes for the small and medium sector industries and uh, the, the the small and medium sector industries are always to be the most neglected and the most back-ended part of but these sme sectors do contribute still to the national and global 20 percent of carbon emissions and now these industries have a bigger use case for carbon capturing going around but what they find upon is there is a challenge that for, there is no technology technology available, which is particularly for the applicants for this sector. So, yeah. Mr. Anything, Mr. Sorry. yeah, hi, I could sense uh, there was a bit of a time lag. Uh, I don't know whether it's a network issue, but if you can, you know, probably uh, try closing the video or uh, maybe it will help. Sure. I'll try that. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so I'll proceed ahead uh, talking about uh, car carbon capture. CCUS is generally uh, used in the heavy sector industries. The civil infrastructure comes along with expensive equipments, takes upon a big space of land. It's process intensive also, does not uh, takes upon low consumables for its operation and is not feasible for low volumes below below 1000 tons per day capacity. So uh, generally the small and medium industries from FNBs, from specialty chemicals and other sectors, which would generally make around 15, 20 TPDs of emission. There's no techno-economic feasibility scale system away out there available for them to come on to CCUS because up here we're talking about an industrial scale where the general applications are about for 2000 tons and over here it's 20 tons it's more than like 100 times the reduction around happening so that is the difficult challenge and we try to focus upon that challenge and convert it to made a technology which can scale down carbon capturing and make it feasible for the SME sector industry and then that's why we introduced to you tube ccu unit which is plug and play and is completely pro portable requires no civil infrastructure no foundation work to be built upon it's specifically designed to operate for 10 to 5 tpds around and so can be additive for more more uh, increment into the volume capacity it still delivers the same industrial grade efficiency of co2 capturing but at a reduced capital cost and a reduced operating cost around. Now, how we done is like we have not created any new uh, one new new process system or such but we have created a new reactor uh, for a process engineering point view, which is a combination of existing standardized uh, chemical operations and systems available we've clustered integrated this power process by by changing this process parameters to create our own unit operation which we and we've put it out into a shipping container up there so generally the the reactor column and the 
with the with the orange and the yellow 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 modules are the are the reactor columns where we actually try to put the entire ccu system in a horizontal structure and with inlets which is the chimney outlets from the industries directly passing through our systems uh, we uh, capture the carbon dioxide uh, with the consumable that can be recycled and reused for 900 uh, 900 more than 900 cycles and can temporarily store co2 at its end also so how we deploy plan to deploy it is that we would be deploying the tube cc units at the a node industrial points across the sectors and across the regions but we'll have a nodal central treatment hub point where all the captured carbon dioxide from this point will be brought together for treatment and recycling purposes and then made the carbon dioxide available in the market for consumption so at the a node point we can capture almost 90 percent of the emissions and by the point we come to valorization is where, the, where we try to make it reutilize availability available back into market we can commit seven so basically uh, from the source emissions if it was 10 tons we can make seven tons readily available to be sold back into the market so that is how we create the use case of the emission as a resource around generally imported co2 cost an industry up to 15 rupees a kg but uh, with the recycled co2 can come around up to 10 rupees or 12 rupees a kg around for that how does this help around for the industries is that uh, you know, it supports ESG and GHG compliances. Uh, most of the Indian industries, textile industries, chemical industries, steel industries, they are into export. So the cross-border taxation coming into up for the carbon tax can be a great driver around for it. We ha currently have clienteles and textiles in FNB and steel industry right now who are keenly using this because their particular client uh, is forcing them in, is enforcing them to incorporate decarbonization initiative because the emissions coming from uh, during the manufacturing point at the vendors and uh, counts as to be the scope three emission for the brands. So that is how uh, the need comes around, uh, around for these industries existing in India and Singapore. Uh, recently looking forward to enter into UAE sector. It's total of a 1.5 billion market just uh, in the region right now. India itself is going to be one of the biggest market in terms of captured carbon re realization by the end of 2030, uh, considering how the export goes. So in 2019, we started with this idea in tech. Uh, by 23, we had completed our R&D. We have our in-house lab here in Pune, where we can capture 10 kgs of CO2 per day, a prototype setup ready. This year in 24, we are going, stepping out of our labs and entering in a pilot stage points. We are doing pilots across all different regions from painting, lights, apples, food, f and again, cement, to even near for a crematorium ground as well. So these are all somewhere between uh, 10 and 15 10 tons per day project, but uh, each unit deployed is five TPD. So we are deploying multiple five TPD units for these and these right now. Just a moment, Mr. Mystery. Industry. I, I, I so would like to see what's looking forward. Hello? Yeah, please. Nothing. I was like, uh, you can continue as in your voice had a lag. That's why I came. Sorry. Please continue. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, we only need an on-field testing and validation right now, which is a pilot stage are giving around, and our pilots are come like two of our pilots are ready, and a few of them are getting commercialized right now. Uh, we are doing some. Uh, we want to do the on-field testing and such ways validation points, and as a fundraise point, we are looking around for a million dollars and such ways for scaling up on to being industrial ready with uh, with the scale projects of. Uh, uh, 10 TP, uh, more than more than 50 and 60 tons per day capacity. The idea of pilot project for an oil and gas company for ages. So we capture the, the the 10 tons per day from ages in Kandla. We're shipping it to Mandvi for post process and treatment, and then Mandvi is another manufacturing hub where the capital comes to be utilized in industries again. So over here we are a team of a very young. People, the average age of the team is nothing but 24 and a half. Uh, and but we are enthusiastic working on this one for four and a half years. But we are backed upon by experts from industries, from academia, and research units like NCL and uh, Imperial College London, and many, many, many more such things. 
So we do have presence around for this and backing up around coming up for this. And our target is that by 2025, we would like to deploy units that with a total capacity of 400 capital for you. So I mean, uh, the agenda is that we want to capture air pollution to utilize it as far as for material around. So that's basically us. So I'm, like, I'm open for questions around here. Quick uh, question about this one. What is the status of the POC that you mentioned that are they operating right now or is it a more in installation phase? Yeah, so we are right now on five total of POCs, of which two are or two are operating. Two would be deployed by uh, by the end by Diwali, that is somewhere in October, November, and the one would be readied by the next next uh, next half of 2025. So that's that's a stage. How long how long the two have been operating? What is the duration? Oh no, they have not been operating for a very long time. The total <laughs> the total runtime for them is nothing more than but two months, two to two and a half months, uh, approx. Oh, okay. No problem. Thank you. I couldn't hear uh, uh, very clearly a lot of what you were saying, but Ronak, I don't know if you touched upon what what would you think? You said you are rated, you are doing multiple units of five TPD as your capacity. What would you think could be the investment that each unit would require? And from a business model perspective, how do you uh, think about you know your revenue and uh, your uh, 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 and, and how, how are you thinking about return on investment on each of these units? Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Mr. Paul. That's that's one of the key questions that we keep getting, understanding the business model point side. So yeah, uh, the central treatment hub point center would be something that would be functioned and run by our RI. Uh, the units would be deployed out, but units would also be going out on a cost price for as a, as a sale as, as a sale unit. Each unit would be coming across for a five tons per day capacity, somewhere roughly of uh, seventy to seventy five lakh rupees. And as you keep going up on the volume size, if if you go for a twenty TPT unit, then that will come around 1.5 CR or such. So it will vary from a 75.75 to 1.5 CR uh, unit. Uh, and more than that, the centralized treatment unit center would be the point where we will be treating it. And post treatment, we will be delivering it. So generally, as of now, right now, what we are doing is the retailer to whom we provide the carbon dioxide after treatment. We are setting up the treatment facility at the retailer's end itself. So all the captured carbon dioxide from the uh, from the A node points industries is brought to the retailer's site, and at the retailer's site itself, we treat. The futuristic plan would be that when we scale up on, we would have our own own uh, treatment center, and then from that treatment center, we would supply to multiple retailers rather than doing it to one retailer itself. Currently, since our volumes uh, pilot projects are just two of them, we are doing it in such way uh, that there would be again a revenue share on the on the on the captured CO2 uh, trade supply. Post the, the other things would be other revenue streams are about the annual maintenance for the units. Uh, which are deployed already on field and the other benefit is around where we also provide them compliances and certifications and carbon auditing services and both points which would be also for the industries to whom we are deploying this thing and also for the retailers inside this this reportings could be used by the manufacturing unit industries to pro, to provide it into their compliances to when they are when they are actually presenting towards their clients or when they are certifying their products or such ways so this is the various streams which from which multiple sites of revenues would be provided coming around for that. But as the right now the volume is less, so we are setting up on this treatment unit at the retailer end itself. But yeah, in futuristic plans would be that we'll have our own retailer retail end point. In future, the plan would be all would also come is also comprising around that we would have a heavy volume of emission being captured and coming towards us and a low demand for the consumption of the captured suit. In such case, then we would be put, uh, we would be shifting the captured CO2 to to, uh, to EOR and the uh, or deep deep uh, sequestration and the deep uh, deep storage point sites, which would then convert credits also. 
So then uh, when we actually go towards the scale, then carbon credit generation will be actually brought to, to picture. That would require minimum of a point where there we have already 15 or 20 industries a node point out and a central unit handling all these 20 industries and when we go at each industry at approximately of 20 tons per day or something so at that scale point we would be able to achieve this uh, sort of a work which would be 4000 tons a day or something so that is how the model will work right now in this pilot stages we are setting up our treatment units at the retailer end itself and on a related note do you see are there similar to you technology the companies for instance in china or some other geography who are doing similar to what you're doing and do you see that as a, I, I don't know where where your competition could come from um, because if somebody has deploying this solution at scale do you see that undercutting because uh, over time um, i mean i think the costs of uh, through cbam and other things the cost for industry would only keep increasing and it's equally relevant in other geographies which are exporting into the European uh, markets, for instance. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, firstly, if I have to just talk about other competing technologies or other competing company in the same field and same arena. Uh, so over there, if I have to say uh, in India as such, uh, most of the players are coming out from abroad, coming coming from up outside and performing out any of the carbon capture projects that are existent on CCUS line side. India is right now working around where we have three to four budding CCUS technologies coming from three to three to four startups like us. But that's a total sum of just three and four. Uh, I can you can completely round it out uh, at five startups who are working around on developing an in-house Indian technology on carbon capture excitements. So that's there, and everybody has their own merits and such ways competing with the existing technologies uh, which are brought upon from us and uk and uk being the specific hub point for ccus line size we have a very big price advantage so many uh, from the current clientels that i have we are surely doing five pilot projects but i have right now interest coming around from nine to eleven industries with the with the signed loi of them uh, and each of the industry has a project of uh, almost 1.5 to 2 crs around coming we also have interest coming around from cement industry and Abu Dhabi and such ways. The reason being these industries have shown an interest is the competitors from US to UK which are coming in. Their, the pricing is almost four to five times to what we are what we can come at upon for. But although we are not ready, hence everybody is on a hold up point. Uh, we uh, on another line on a geopolitical scenario when you talk about why the other uh, why the other nations would be working around for. So when we work with Singapore, I actually work with Singaporean government to create a cluster in everywhere existing around on CCUS line, the CO2, there is clusterization model which goes around where the carbon captured is brought to centralized location and then pumped into oil and gas storage points and EUR activities and other things, which is actually handled by the government or a government body or a government assigned authority. This is the model which is the most predominant model used in UK. But this is only for CCS, which is called carbon capture and storage. Uh, what we are promoting up here is a CCU, uh, CCU cluster. So generally clusters have been designed and this model has been uh, phenomenally tried out for storage side points. But what we are experimenting is to do utilization. We are creating a carbon cluster, but the focus is for a use case point. So we don't want to store it and we want to use a storage as a thing. Now this has worked best when you have a geography which supports this thing. Now, considering what when I worked in Singapore with the Jurong government, Jurong is an island entirely designed for industrial activities and it has super, superb and phenomenal infrastructure. So when we plan around something for like something like this, where the emissions of one industry is directly used up and all the emissions of the island stays within the island itself, the infrastructure and the geography should support that. Whereas in India, we have found located out many such cases. Uh, such cluster location out of which the Gulf of Kutch, the Gujarat Bay area happens to be one of the best predominant sector. So is the Paradi region in the eastern coast side. So these are the two areas where clusterization could be freshly bought. Also the I IDCs, yeah, rather it be the GIDC, Gujarat Industrial Development Sector cluster or MIDC or PIDC or anything, the state government IDC sector areas are also very beneficial if we want to deploy such an activity around for. So we do see there is a potential where we in, uh, we can use cluster models for utilization cases in India. Uh, and I mean, we have, uh, the, it's just the scale, with, if I have to talk about difficulty and challenge is the scale. Uh, 
because the emission scale is much more currently at today's time in India as per what the demand for CO2 is, the captured CO2 is in India. So the ones that demand also keeps increasing uh, in which we are seeing a rapid increase of that also coming around. Once that keep, keeps up power, we can use our own emissions to create, uh, to, to suffice to our needs. That's, that's the vision up here. Um, with the permission, uh, uh, there uh, I can see one hand raised. Uh, I'll allow Mr. Iram uh, from e waste Social. Uh, they have a question. Hi, Iram. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, this is Iram here. Hello. Yeah, you're audible. Please yeah, go ahead. I, hello, hello. Yeah, I just wanted to understand, like, you know, this carbon capture, could you be, it would it be possible for you to do it at a, uh, like, you know, you said you have a 5 ton and a 10 ton capacity, but then there are, there are smaller, like, you know, plants, which I'm talking about is like waste management plants. Would it be possible for you hmm. to devise some solution for those plants as well? Uh, so yeah, I mean waste management, or I mean the previous uh, the previous participant mentioned that in biogas production also there's a kind of ca ca carbon dioxide emission happening uh, during syn gas production. So we have worked around with those projects as well. So I mean it just depends what is the volumes that we are trying to work. The industrially designed the the, the reactor the model setup structure goes around is particularly designed for five TPD. It can also operate for three TPDs and such ways. But I mean, this is the product that I mentioned around. The tech can surely work around in different scales also. I mean, current unit that I have in the lab is working for 10 kgs also. Okay, but okay. Uh, it would not be then a recommended point on a when you when you try to uh, jot down all the economics for the runtime, the operation, the business trade, the logistics of the captured carbon dioxide and everything. If if everything feasibles out, then it would be a suggested idea uh, for a very low volume application, like maybe hundred kgs or such thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but technologically wise, it is surely possible. Whether okay. the economics works out, we have to understand as per the case that you are trying to pitch. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Ronak, I have one more question. I think uh, we should uh, consider the last. Probably, uh, we are running out of time. I want to be. Uh, you know, giving time for the next startup as well. Uh, so there is one question by Mr. Rishabh R. There are other two. Maybe you can take it up separately and type in the answers. Uh, Ronak, sure. I'm requesting you. This one uh, would be, uh, you know, what contributes to lesser selling price of carbon dioxide captured through CCU's tech versus other sources? Is transportation cost included in the price comparison presented by you? Yeah. So, uh, firstly, asking around uh, about the point, what 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 is the price benefit of captured carbon dioxide? Yeah. So many a times when you try when you talk when we talk about uh, utilization of CO two in industrial application, rather it could be welding, rather it could be calcination, or rather it could be any of the storage or cryogenization purpose or such ways. Uh, these these application areas specifically calcination, for example, does not necessarily require a high grade which is like but okay. currently market lower grade We're losing you to network because the only only grade material in which you two can be sold in market am i fine now when you say fine when i just uh... You know, come in, then your you know voice becomes. No, no, okay, I'll just I'll just quickly. So I was mentioning yeah, yeah, that uh, there is no necessary need in many applications and in industries for a high high grade material. Many industry applications can work on low grade material, uh, low grade CO two as well. But a market availability of CO two on lower grade is not available because it cannot be sold for lower material. There is no production of lower grade CO two happening like as such. Hence, unnecessarily these industrial sectors have to pay the premium price for a premium premium product which is not required as from them. Uh, in such cases, this kind of application works around where we can provide a CO two which it can be of any grade or lower grade also, and that. Could be of a lower price and that can benefit rather than us to them buying up a premium product at a premium price one is that second is captured co2 can be much more beneficial because you can off you can show it in your offsets esg compliances and other places in tremendous manner and that could create a different different based of support 
costs. Uh, why captured CO2 could be lower of cost in terms is the extra benefits when we actually add up. The economics actually will show that it can it can be brought down to a lower cost. Also, uh, industrial grade available CO2 many a times is done by production of fuel or is done by chemical reaction. So that requires a heavy source of chemical input coming around. Over here, the emissions are happening so many a times you will not necessarily re require the buyer to pay the entire price for the production of the CO2. But the CO2, the CO2 emitters actually pay for the capture and the buyer is only paying for the CO2 treatment process up there. Also, we're talking, talking about in terms of the logistic cost around. So, I mean, right now what I have quoted as a price of 12, 10 rupee and 12 rupee a kg is not having all the logistics involved. It has a minimum distance. We have considered it as to be a 30 kilometer radius distance and quoted this price. If the logistics is beyond 30 kilometer radius, the, the pricings would vary around with the logistics in being taken into that. I hope I answer the particular gentleman's question. Uh, thank you, Ronak. I think you can take it up uh, separately as well in the Q&A box. Uh, now, moving ahead with very less time in hand. Um, you know, I thank you, uh, Ronak. Uh, I would request you to take the questions. Uh, Thanks. Thank, over you, the and thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Mr. Bobby. And thank you. Yes, I am getting some requests for presentations and also for connecting. So that I'll take after the session. And uh, now I invite uh, the last presentation of the day. Uh, Miss, uh, should I invite? Uh, Miss, I will invite Mr. Suhail Sheikh from Voltaics Alpha, Voltaics Alpha, to uh, please present his presentation. Yeah, thank Hi. you, Mr. Suhail. And I'm really sorry. Uh, we, you know, usually, but you have uh, time with the permission of the experts. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, should I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Give me a second. I'll put it from screen mode. Yeah. Are you able to share? Yeah, it is coming yeah. up. Yeah. Okay, so I'll start. Hi, I'm Suhail. Uh, I'll be discussing about peer-to-peer uh, -peer energy, uh, agrivoltaics, and uh, redox flow battery. So, uh, Voltex Alpha is a company which is incubated at Social Alpha. It is uh, very immensely supported by the Clean Energy International Incubation Center. Uh, so, Tata Power is part of the uh, a, a private pa a public private partnership between Government of India and Trust and Tata Power. Uh, and this is my team. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm one of the co-founders. Uh, I graduated from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, uh, studying climate change. Uh, one of my co-founders is from IIT Bombay, PhD, uh, Energy Sciences. Uh, and Parvesh Bharti uh, is uh, from Civil Engineering background from PUSA. So the challenges that we are trying to address is this: uh, that there's a underserved market uh, of uh, electricity, uh, and of course uh, we want to achieve a lot of solar parks, but the land is unavailable for that. A uh, large part of the agriculture farms are being utilized for uh, development of solar park, and the cost of energy storage is unviable. Lithium-ion batteries are expensive, so we are also working on a. Uh, chemistry, uh, which is cheaper and will last 25 years. Uh, that's what uh, solar plant life is. Generally, a solar plant will last for 25 years or 30 years, maybe if properly maintained. And that's the kind of battery we are building. So uh, we have a solution where we are using net metering. Uh, we are installing solar parks uh, in agriculture land, uh, but these uh, uh, plants are installed at 3.5 meter above the ground. And we can continue doing normal agriculture activities there. Uh, and we use net metering to supply the energy to a commercial or industrial buyer along with the ESG benefits. Uh, in some cases, the carbon credit may not be available, but there's a separate arrangement to get the carbon credit uh, with Tata Power. So in peer-to-peer -peer energy, we are also providing free energy uh, for the agriculture need. So part of the energy which is generated will actually directly be used on the farm. Uh, for storing energy at microgrid level uh, or for uh, maintaining the 
in some cases the grid frequency needs to be maintained so it requires energy storage uh, we have flow batteries along with it bombay and the entire energy that we produce is using esg so in a sense we are working on a peer to peer energy uh, which will be the future of energy uh, i mean like it's similar to a mobile phone user i can use my phone and i can switch between jio vodafone or other networks similarly uh, in in a decade or so we'll be living in a in a situation where we can switch between tata power or reliance or any other service provider and we want the uh, farmers to benefit out of this uh, development so as i mentioned uh, we are uh, at present working on agrivoltaics where we'll install the uh, solar plants uh, at present we are working on a 5 megawatt uh, agrivoltaics plant in delhi uh, the picture that you see in the background that's 1.2 megawatt plant in delhi uh, which is already operational the agriculture activity has not started yet uh, but soon we'll also start on that so the idea is pretty simple the uh, subsidized energy or the free energy uh, cost is actually borne by the commercial and the industrial buyers in any city or any state uh, most of the farmers will get free energy but actually the commercial and industrial clients are paying for it so in this peer to peer energy network we want to uh, reduce that burden on the discom and supply the clean energy to the commercial and industrial buyer through co purchase agreement uh, which are generally long term ranging from 15 years to 30 years agreements so this is the uh, idea that we are working on and also i'll i'll like to mention that uh, peer to peer energy in india is very different uh, compared to peer to peer energy in australia or let's say germany because the policy which we have it's not very conducive for the peer to peer energy but within the given policy domain we can still work on the peer to peer energy so essentially uh, the uh, at present we started with installation of uh, uh, solar parks or solar plants ranging between 1 megawatt to 5 megawatt in delhi uh, and soon we'll shift it to solar rooftop businesses as well and uh, there would be a ledger uh, which is available for any buyer and the energy rates are visible it's uh, easy to discover at what price any buyer would like to buy energy for a specific period of time so uh, for this entire p2p energy making it possible uh, we are working on agrivoltaics while we are working on agrivoltaics we have designed the uh, when i say design we we have the engineering design uh, which makes it easier to work on the uh, work on the development of the solar parks along with uh, development of the agriculture we are using climate resilient agriculture technique the agriculture will of course will be done by us uh, and then a lot of knowledge that was available at different institutions are being converged to do this for example which seed to use uh, which would be pest resistant that knowledge is coming from tata institute of genetics and society uh similarly uh, i mean like what type of crops will be resilient given the temperature change and the fluctuations uh, of uh, the weather pattern that is happening uh, that knowledge is available with the organization like bio uh, it's a few which was also supported by tata trust uh, for quite some time uh, the next part of the innovation is a uh, vanadium redox flow battery uh, which can store energy at micro grid level or grid balancing level uh, and the advantage is this uh, the vanadium redox flow battery are actually 25 years uh, life batteries uh, which lithium ion is generally 9 years maximum uh, a lithium ion battery will be about 3000 cycles a vanadium redox flow battery will be about 10000 cycles uh, and the uh, most important part is this the raw material to develop the batteries it's available in india so vanadium is a very commonly known available material uh, which we are using to develop the batteries here in india uh, and of course there are some innovations on the design of the plant which uh, which reduces the use of concrete which makes it uh, uh, i mean resistant to wind at 170 km per hour speed uh, and also enables uh, the protection of the equipment for example let's say the rainfall is high and the field is flooded so how do we protect the equipment so these are the minor innovations which are clubbed together to make it a major innovation of course any peer to peer energy without the software innovation it's not possible 
So there is a software stack, uh, which of course uh, has a blockchain ledger built into it. Already, uh, I mean, a lot of innovations has happened. For example, in the discom where we work, uh, the uh, reading of the meters is actually wireless. I mean, there's no manual reading, which take, takes place and the entire building happens without any human intervention in that since it's all built in the software. So we have built a stack, which is easy to plug into SAP. That's what most of the organizations will be using as a discom. And with that, we would be able to uh, bring the peer-to-peer -peer energy on a major scale in India. Uh, the partnership advantages that we have, uh, I mean, at, at, the, at the solar front, uh, at the solar front, at the discom front, already we have thought of our partnerships, uh, which help us to do this on the battery front. We have uh, a partner like IT Bombay, where I worked uh, and I was handling the Tata Center. So uh, yeah, on professional, personal level, uh, there's a lot of support available from IT Bombay. Also, we have in-house capability. We have a team of about seven people now, which ranges between execution of solar plant, designing of solar plants, uh, doing simulations, as well as business development. Uh, for finance partnerships, we are uh, leveraging, uh, I, I'll be very honest, we are leveraging the Tata Power partnership a lot because the uh, partners mentioned over here are actually Tata Power partners. They have a new use with Tata Power, which makes it easier to fund uh, large solar parks. On the agri-tech partnerships, we have uh, BIOF as a partner and Sustain Plus, again, uh, an entity uh, which pilots a lot of uh, agriculture development and energy plus agri-tech innovations in India uh, under Tata Trust. So the present status that we have, uh, we already have uh, built our, uh, I mean, like we have, we, we work on the ground, uh, being a co-founder, uh, the entire team member, which the entire team that we have, they have really good understanding of solar. We spent about uh, two years in designing solar plants and installing solar plants on rooftop. We generated revenue of about 2.2 crores. Then we partnered with Tata Power, uh, Tata Power Trading Corporation Limited to make gross net metering, open access, sale of agrivoltaics uh, within India from Delhi to other uh, other places, uh, or intrastate, uh, I mean, a sale of energy in that sense possible. We have an MOU. Uh, with uh, Tata Power Trading Corporation Limited. Also, the plant that you see over here, uh, it's an installed plant where it will be conducting the agri-tech activities. The Venetian Redox Flow battery is also piloted uh, al along with a telecom partner uh, and IT Bombay. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that we have all, all pieces of puzzle set together to make the next leap. Uh, we, we have a target of about... Uh, Five megawatt, which we'll complete within this financial year. Uh, in four years, we want to do 100 megawatt of agrivoltaics plus peer-to-peer -peer energy uh, in Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra. Major major of these plants will come around these places. Uh, so some of the benefits of agrivoltaic systems would be that uh, the farmer continues uh, working as a, on the land to develop the crops to harvest the crop the entire, uh, they also go through a capacity building activity. Also, some of the advantages that we have is that once we have the farmers together, uh, we can innovate more on the agri-tech front uh, because uh, they can be mobilized, the logistics becomes easier uh, because the company, uh, generally a solar park is a special purpose vehicle. Uh, so a special purpose vehicle along with a farmer producing organization will be able to take credit, uh, let's say develop a food processing unit, uh, and could also diversify into other areas of uh, food value chain in that sense. Also, we'll install small weather mo uh, mi uh, micro weather monitoring stations, uh, which makes it to collect the weather pattern data very easy. That helps to do helps us to do the scientific uh, backed uh, agriculture easily. Also, we reduce a lot on the water consumption. Uh, we also reduce the rate of the soil salinity. Uh, by uh, by using advanced soil sensor networks, which will be deployed in the agrivoltaics. Of course, the money which the farmers will earn from the land lease for solar will be different compared to the uh, income from the agriculture activity. So we are envisaging uh, the increase of farmers' income from 1.5 times to around three times. So essentially, the ESG is that we are... Uh, Targeting, uh, I mean, we started with the idea of sustainable food 
production uh, but essentially we are also kind of a partnership for the goals while we are developing the peer to peer energy network i think we are encompassing and covering more than the sustainable food pro uh, production uh, uh, target so this is about voltaic alpha open to questions maybe i can go first uh, uh, so here uh, yes. you know given that you are partnering with farmers in 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 doing this is there a investment neutral uh, uh you know platform that you could provide where farmers really don't have to invest in really you are actually enabling an investment through a certain source and you you potentially live off and the farmers get the benefit, you know, it's like a rental income for them in terms of providing their land and access to it. And you're essentially providing the service, which, uh, you know, uh, power which you feed into the grid and, and, and your economics works in that fashion. Have you thought about something like that as a model? And given that you're working with Tata Power and Tata Power Solar does do certain aspects as far as rooftop solutions are concerned, something like that. And yeah. if so, uh, what... For those kind of projects, what kind of ROIs are you seeing in terms of given the current price of uh, uh, power, uh, you know, in terms of grid parity, power pricing, what what kind of ROIs are you seeing uh, under various uh, debt equity mix that you see for such projects? So uh, uh, I'll be very honest, we are not taking any money from the farmers uh, uh, for development of the solar parks. Uh, the money will come through investors. Uh, in this case, uh, the initial uh, solar plant development that we are doing, we are also not taking the money from Tata Power. We are inviting investors. These are infra investors uh, who will come in for a project return, which uh, the IRR generally ranges between 15% to 25%, depending on the uh, location, the geography. Uh, and as I mentioned, this this uh, fifteen percent to twenty five percent IRR is just the uh, solar or the sale of the energy. Uh, the agriculture income will be more per acre. Uh, the envisaged, uh, I mean, like revenue could be between fifty thousand to one lakh, depending on the uh, water availability, soil condition, and other factors. Uh, uh, there was one more question. I think I missed. Uh, the what what kind of uh, debt equity mix are you looking at in terms of such thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So essentially, uh, uh, I mean, like uh, generally, one sol one megawatt solar park, uh, agrivoltaic park in that sense, will cost us about four point five crores. Uh, we are looking at five megawatt development. One point two megawatt is already developed. In this case, the client actually invested their own money uh, because they also wanted to help the farmers. So essentially, we have corporates, uh, MSMEs who are highly interested. Uh, they Some of the part will be their money, some part will be actually coming as debt or equity by any investors. So an equity investor, as I mentioned, I mean, like uh, the project IRR is which between 15% to 25%. Uh, let's say if uh, there's a debt partner, they might be able to, if, if it's a lease financing, again, it could be 14%. Uh, and depending on the equity investor at what time they want to uh, kind of exit, uh, the percentage will vary in that sense, I mean, depending on the time scale. Thanks. Who is the purchaser of this electricity? And, uh, uh, yeah. hmm. Sorry, sir, please, please. Who is please, the purchaser please. of this electricity? Uh, the purchaser, uh, the Delhi, uh, in Delhi, uh, at least in majority of the places, the purchaser of the electricity will be a commercial buyer. It is not the discount, neither the farmer. So when you sell to the commercial buyers, uh, I'm sure you will be aware that uh, you need to also connect to the grid and transmit it across the grid. So you have to pay certain charges, et cetera, et cetera. So what yeah. does the delivered cost to the customer looks like? Yeah. So essentially when we are working, when the client is in the same discom area, let's say in Delhi, where we are working right now, there are three discoms. We are majorly working with the BSCS Rajasthani area and the Tata Power DDL area, uh, that's New Delhi Power Limited, NDPL. Uh, so generally, we'll be able to generate electricity per unit rate of about 4.6 uh, or 8, and we would be able to sell it at about uh, 7, 
सेवन पॉइंट फाइव मैक्सिमम एट रुपीज सॉरी अनदर आई मीन इन दोर पॉइंट फाइव और फोर पॉइंट एट रुपीज पर यूनिट दर इज अनदर एडिशन ऑफ अबाउट फिफ्टी पैसे टू वन रुपीज फॉर द लैंड रिलीज सो आई मीन दस जनरल यूनिट रेट ट्रांसमिशन चार्जेस एंड क्रॉस सब्सिडी सरचार्ज Uh, in 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 the if you are working in the same discom we do not have to pay anything to the discom uh in some cases uh the infra might need some upgradation so we may have to pay for that at may range between 50 lakh to 1 crore uh again that money that we pay to the discom will be kind of uh i mean over a period of certain 5 years or so it will be taken out from the energy cost meaning uh the discom will give us additional electricity for the cost we paid for the infra upgrade uh in cases where the intrastate transmission is happening in that case we have to pay uh to the discom uh, or to the transmission company or to the municipal corporation as well in some cases they may charge money there is a cross subsidy surcharge you are aware of that right yeah yeah so generally i mean let's say if i am able to produce energy at uh, maharashtra and i want to supply it to some microsoft let's say in karnataka so i generate electricity at about 4.5 and the cross uh, subsidy charges including all the transmission charges and everything it might range between 1.5 rupees to 2.5 rupees on the higher side so yeah i mean generally uh, uh, a commercial entity may pay between 9 rupees to 12 rupees per unit uh, depending on which location the cross subsidy surcharge so if A customer wants to purchase from somebody else apart from the distribution company, which is supplying in that area. They have to pay a certain surcharge unless they set up a captive power plant. Yeah. Are you aware of that charge? Yes. So I am aware of the surcharge. So depending on the time of the day when I am consuming the electricity, no the... cross subsidy surcharge. so generally if you are saying the cross subsidy surcharge what i understand is that the commercial is paying for offsetting the uh, farmer electricity or the domestic electricity yeah. that is the cross subsidization that happens in most of the state so in our case uh, because we will be using net metering uh, when we are doing within the same state uh, we do not pay any cross subsidy because we are directly giving the farmer free electricity and also uh, when we are doing uh, the open yeah. and... but the farmer doesn't need it you are selling uh, it to a commercial customer farmer doesn't really need the electricity you have to sell it to someone else yeah uh, yeah so let's say if i'm doing uh, 1 megawatt of uh, plant uh, development uh, 100 kilowatt or so could be easily used for the agriculture purpose which could be irrigation or the soil sensor network yeah, okay. or the... so think about it i don't want to spend too much time on this thing but you should be aware of this particular thing that how are you going to sell this electricity uh yeah i mean like we have already sold it i mean the plant that you see it's already i mean like we have done it and the cross subsidy charge that you are saying uh i mean depending on the discom or depending on the state there are different rules that we have to follow at least in delhi uh, we do not have that yeah okay fair enough no problem I so here I would request you to take up the questions. Uh, you know, you can type in the answers. I'll just take one uh, question. Uh, there are two by Mr. Rishab. Uh, um, he is asking that will agri voltaic system affect crop yields since the plants are seemingly getting devoid of sunlight? And uh, what is the cost of setting up per acre farm uh, of farmland? And who shall invest the money? I think partly it has been taken up. So. yeah so uh, i'll i'll try to answer very briefly uh, so uh, the farm size needed uh, generally we require between 4 acre to 6 acre uh, for a plant of 1 megawatt and uh, what happens to the crop yield uh, generally there's interspacing between the panels uh, and based on the crop type and the location the design of the plant is as such that Uh, uh the crops will get the sunlight that they need it is based on a scientific calculation that we have there's an equation uh when i say there's an equation it is based on data uh which has been i mean there are multiple agrovoltaics research happened throughout india and uh, other countries as well so we use that knowledge to build the plant thanks sohail thanks for the presentation and uh, you know uh, 
there have been requests for connecting and for the presentations. Uh, maybe you can share an abridged version with Vicky, which we can then share further. Or, uh, you know, same with the case of other other startups as well. And with this, uh, you know, we've overshot the time and we come to the close of the uh, uh, the showcase. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity from the Fiki Center for Sustainability Leadership to thank our experts for the day. Uh, you know, they've, they've really been kind and stayed back. Uh, we've overshot by almost 20 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Bobby Polly, for joining us and for your expert comments and questions. Thank you, Mr. Agarwal, uh, for joining Fiki. And we look forward to your continued support and presence at such forums. And with the kind of participation that we are seeing from the audience, I guess uh, it's really a, a very fruitful session. I have been getting multiple requests to continue the showcases and to you know connect with these startups. We look forward to your presence in future sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.